on ZipRecruiter, we have 20 different ads for the same position. <laughs> 20 different ads for the same position. They were always so intimidating to get questions because, I mean, I know the answer to them, but I have to mold my response the way that I'm told to mold my response. for a SIDCOR office in uh, Cherry Hill, New Jersey as an mm -hmm. admin, and you were actually still working there when you contacted us. Yeah. Uh, in your initial message, you said that you had been working there for three months when you realized something was wrong, and that when you started, you had no idea that you were associated with SIDCOR. So mm -hmm. if you don't mind, what did you kind of, you got a, a feeling a few months in, what did you kind of notice that in your mind was wrong? And when did you first know that you were uh, working for a SIDCOR affiliate? Good question. So I first noticed that things were strange actually when I was applying, um, just based on the job ad, which I came to learn a lot more about. Um, I did some ad writing for them. So just from the job ad itself, it was kind of, I didn't get a good understanding of what the ad was actually for. Uh, but I applied anyway, because I was job searching and really wanted a job. Um, so I applied. The recruiting process was really weird. Um, they sent me an email to call them to talk about the open role, but they never said what role it was that I applied for, um, which I thought was kind of weird because then I didn't know if it was a phone interview. And if it was a phone interview, why didn't they have a scheduled time to talk about the role. So it was just weird that I would set, like, get, give them a random call because then, you know, phone tag happens and I don't know. It was weird. Um, so they, my manager didn't have an admin at the time. So he actually called me and he phone screened me. Um, but I still was like, is this a phone interview? I don't know. It took a couple minutes, maybe five minutes. So I didn't know if it was a phone interview or what it was, but um, so that was a red flag to begin with, but when I went in for my interview, I did not see how the ad that I applied for had anything to do with the role that he was talking about, which was selling energy in Walmart. I had no idea that that was the role that this ad was posted for, which was, again, another red flag, but... So I left feeling kind of uh, duped that I went in for this interview, I was really excited, and it turned out to be something that was just not what I was looking for. But the next day he called me and he was going to offer me the position, but I told him that it's not something I'm interested in, so he offered me the admin role instead. So I was thinking, oh, this has absolutely nothing to do with sales. So I would love to do that. Um, and I was really excited. And about two weeks in, he started to have me on the national admin calls. And that's when I was like, what is the national admin call? Because I thought that this was a startup marketing firm in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. <laughs> because he had just moved from Rochester, New York, his office closed. So he got sent to Cherry Hill, which is really random. <laughs> but I thought it was a, a small startup marketing firm in Cherry Hill. But yeah, so when he said it's a national admin call, um, I'll use a name here, I don't mind. Her name's Jenny McGuire. She is the national admin for SIDCOR. And um, so he was explaining her role to me. And that's when I realized, so we're working under a corporation, technically, if we're having national admin calls. And there's like 30 different administrators on this call. Yeah, so a couple things about that. Number one, um, it's interesting how that's how you learned about SIDCOR, because your, mm -hmm. your owner, um, you sent us a couple calls, which we'll break down later. He pretty much um, denied that SIDCOR has any influence over, over him and his, his operation. Yeah. Um, 
And then you also said you never, they never said what role in your interview that, that you were applying for, which goes mm-hmm. in direct contrast to the other phone call that you sent us where she says, make sure they know what the role is. Say, mm-hmm. Make sure the role is consistent. So right. uh, a lot of red flags there for sure that we'll, uh, we'll be able to wrap up before we're done here. Um, so then you started, once you figured out you were essentially working for a Sidcor franchise, it's basically like a McDonald's franchise, it's mm-hmm. how they run. Um, you started, you know, your, your senses kind of started tingling. You started doing some research. You ended up finding the slave circle and, mm-hmm. um, but you, you stayed. I mean, it wasn't something where you found it and it was like, oh, I'm out, you know, yeah. you still stayed. So I'm kind of curious, what was, mm-hmm. how did you approach your day-to-day tasks knowing that? this is like a really shady operation. Yeah, (laughs) that's such a good question. Um, I kind of, and this is a common theme that I've noticed in the other extra takes that I've seen. A lot of administrators really like their owner or manager. Um, So they kind of stay in it for that person. It was kind of the same. I kind of felt, you know, human to human, I kind of felt bad for my manager because he was, he started in Illinois, went to Rochester, and then came to Cherry Hill. And I felt bad that his business was not steady. Um, and when he moved into Cherry Hill in January, he didn't have an administrator. So I felt like, well, if I leave after two months, I would just have felt really bad to do that to him. Um, and I know he's capable of running the office, like he did before I was there, but I guess that kind of kept me in the game. But at the same time, it just got to a point where my work was really slacking because, you know, I'm the first point of contact for these candidates who really want a job and they think it's a great opportunity, but on the inside, I know it's not a good opportunity. It's a dead end job. It's not going to lead you anywhere fruitful in most cases. So that was definitely difficult. And it was actually pretty beneficial. Um, We had a unique situation because of COVID. So we were all working remotely, which kind of allowed me to slack on my work and watch your extra takes. (laughs) So going back to the interview process of how you you got involved in this, um, you you mentioned in your message a few times about the vagueness of everything. Mm -hmm. And, And anyone who's watched uh, anyone who's been through this, anyone who's watched any of our other videos knows that's kind of a theme. Like the, mm-hmm. everyone's really vague about everything. Um, you said specifically that the position description that you applied for was very vague and they had a, an emphasis on entry level employees to train for leadership and management roles. And you also said you're a recent college grad. So like any college grad, that sounds great. It's almost like, okay, I can get my career off and running at this point. Um, then you met, or you, like you said, you had the phone interview and your owner was very vague again mm-hmm. and that you had no idea really what you were going to be doing. But then you also said that the interview was, was actually tough mm-hmm. um, and that you said that later you found out this was designed to make the candidate feel privileged to work for the company. Like they had to kind of <laughs> fight, kind mm-hmm. of fight for it, right? Um, so, uh, you know, how did you feel about that when you learned that since you, you didn't really learn that until you got involved a little bit deeper? Right. Um, so, huh, let me think about this. I guess I started to put it together like, it was weird seeing the interviews from my perspective because I had already gone through the interview process. So I would sit on a couple interviews that my manager would do because he wanted eventually me to do these preliminary interviews. Um, And he said some of the questions that he asks are pretty tough and they're designed to give them a challenge so that when they are invited back for a second interview or in some cases directly offered the position, it's quite an accomplishment. Because, yeah, I made it through that really tough interview. They really are interested in me. They really want me to be on their team. So it felt like even that feels dishonest to me. It just feels like the position itself is being sugarcoated in a way that you're, you're being asked all these difficult questions about your motivators, yourself, 
where you're going to be in five years, these pretty tough questions um, that really don't correlate to the position at all. You outlined an awful lot of deceit um, in the entire process, really. And that's, you, that's you know, when you said you really started to question um, what you were doing. You started noticing that uh, things you were saying to candidates on the phone uh, and in, in just the whole interview process really didn't match with what was reality, um, in a sense. Mm -hmm. So, like, what were some of the things that you noticed um, in your mind were deceitful? So we had a script to follow for phone screening candidates. And, you know, the first part's the introduction. And then you ask them why they are leaving their current position or what they're looking for in a new position. And their answer to that question is called their hotspot. And you've probably heard that before. And basically the hotspot is what they really want out of a position. So we tailor the rest of our script, the presentation of our script of the position to that hotspot. So if they're looking for a good salary, then we offer a really competitive salary. Um, sometimes we would use the term salary, even though it's not salary, it's completely commission-based. Uh, so that's very deceitful. Also, if they were looking for more time to spend with their family, uh, we offer a flexible schedule, especially after the training process. You can pick any five days of the week, which is pretty deceitful as well because it's really only Thursday through Monday. The script itself was really moldable to tailor it to what the candidate's really looking for. And we've always been taught to stay in control of the conversation. But paradoxically, the candidate is in control because everything we say is changed to what they are saying, to what the candidate's saying and to what the candidate wants. Yeah. And I think we're, we're hitting on a couple important factors here um, that admins even though the, the, the kind of the goal of the job is, is different, like your, your goal is to get people into the office and apply for the job and get them in. Whereas on the sales side, the goal is, is to, to get you inspired to get out there and make sales. But the exact same techniques are, are being used here. Um, like you said, tailoring to their goals. Um, you know, if anyone who's watch the film knows they talk about the four F's in this business. Mm -hmm. So whatever you're in this business for, if you're in this business to make money, financial freedom, if you're in this business for, uh, you know, to be able to make enough money to take time off, that's free time. If you're in this business to uh, be successful enough to spend time with your family, that's family, you know, or to be well known in this business, that's fame. One of those four F's and they always frame your day and they frame your successes and failures to go along with that. You know, so like if you're if, if you're having a, a rough day and you're having trouble with motivating yourself, they'll be like, well, you're not going to make that that financial freedom. If financial freedom is is your goal or oh, well, you're not going to be successful enough to, to get free time if you don't push yourself further. And it and sounds like as on the admin side, you kind of do the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. You might not call it the four F's, but it's you know, it's well, what are you what are you looking for? And you also mentioned in your message kind of a don't ask, don't tell policy, whereas if the candidate doesn't ask about some aspect of the business, like say compensation or, or time off or benefits, that you're supposed to not talk about that mm -hmm. kind of thing, which I figure is kind of strange because if I'm interested in a job, if I've applied to this job, I'm interested in it, I would think that you as a company would want me to know as much about that position as possible, mm -hmm. right? Right. Um, so like what I'm, I'm curious, like how, how did you handle things like that when um, candidates either didn't have the information that they wanted or mm -hmm. it was brought up later that it just, it wasn't yeah. a good fit for them? Yeah. So again, because of COVID, we had unique opportunities. We were all working from home. Uh, there was a period of time where we weren't getting paid because my manager was in the process of applying for the SBA loan. Um, but in the meantime, we were kind of voluntarily training over Zoom. And we were working with my manager's promoting owner's office. So 
his administrator was training me and we would do these mock calls where I would be phone screening her as a potential candidate. And she would, so you're familiar with the law of averages, uh, the, the four impulse factors. She would always say that I would Jones myself out of a sale with the candidate because I would offer too much information about the position. And one of the, I guess, policies that we were supposed to follow is called KISS, keep it short and simple, yep. um, which the salespeople use in their um, tactics. Uh, but I would always, according to her, I would always talk too much about the position. And I would ask her, well, if I was the candidate applying for this position and I was being phone screened, I would want to know as much about the position as possible. And I told her that I think I would like to have honest fits for this position, um, not just scheduling as many interviews as possible on the calendar, which is what we were supposed to do. Uh, but normally the compensation is where I would offer too much information because if a candidate was looking for, oh, I'm really looking for 50,000 a year, it would feel so dishonest to tell them, which we are, we're trained to tell them, oh, we have an hourly guarantee plus an uncapped commission structure. So if you work really hard, you know, depending on your work ethic, you can totally do that. That's totally doable, which in reality, it's really not because you're going to be way overworked. You're going to be working on every off day you have. So naturally, no candidate is going to be looking for that. Um, so most candidates would get turned off when I would say, oh, we have an hourly guarantee plus an uncapped commission structure. Uh, it's normally around thirty to 35000 a year. And that's usually not doable for a lot of people. So in the reality, and, and they obviously don't want you to know this, but that's more like an owner's salary of, of mm -hmm. every year is thirty to yep. 35000 You had talked about ad writing. Mm -hmm. um, that you had uh, spent some time writing ads for your uh, for your company, which you know you mentioned too that they're always very vague. You usually don't know what the job consists of. Uh, do you remember any like the the specific details, the specific wording that went into the ads that you wrote? Mm -hmm. So we have on ZipRecruiter we have twenty different ads for the same position. <laughs> 20 different ads for the same position. And every single one of those ads revolves around the same ideas of entry level into management. That's super stressed. Um, it's also really stressed that you have an hourly guarantee plus commission, which actually is false, I came to learn. Um, because at least with SIDCOR, the hourly guarantee is technically a loan so after making a certain amount in your commissions, what you got as an hourly guarantee starts to come out of your paycheck over time. Um, so yeah, hourly guarantee plus commission, entrepreneurship opportunity, entry level marketing representative. Um, yeah, event marketing. Sales, I'm curious. Was that was that kind of an off limits word or yes. So my trainer said not to use the word sales often, use the word use the term customer service. But when I started to realize that this is very dishonest, when I was writing ads, I would make sure to put sales. This is a sales position <laughs> in the ad, which I don't know if I was supposed to do that, but I, if I were looking through ads and I saw this as a sales position in a retail setting, I would not apply. Yeah. You did voice your concerns a little bit to, um, to your trainer about specifically uh, like what you were talking about, not explaining the position uh, to, to use your words, to a candidate who deserves to know. Mm -hmm. uh, and you were pretty much told, get comfortable with it. Yeah. Um, so that's, uh, you know, essentially putting you on your back foot, telling you, you know, get in line and, and listen to what we're, we're saying. Um, mm -hmm. did that make your job a little bit harder at that point? Yes, <laughs> it was. I mean, not only was it kind of a rude 
way to say it. It was just like, well, you know, I have a valid concern about the business operations that are taking place here. And you're telling me, well, just to get comfortable with it. Um, Cause I, what I told him, he was my owner's promoting owner. And sometimes he would take part in these um, training sessions that I would have with his admin. I told a lot about the position to the candidate and my trainer said, you know, you're, you're telling too much about the position. They never asked about it. So why are you telling them about it? Um, and I told her, well, I'm, I've never spoken to a candidate on the phone and not explained the position before. So I'm really uncomfortable with that. And he was like, well, you better get comfortable with it. I was like, uh, well, not only is that really rude, but that's also very dishonest. <laughs> In the interview process, you talk about um, uh, mo more things that shouldn't be discussed. So more deception. Um, you said that unless explicitly asked, you were not to tell a candidate about the schedule slash hours of the position over the phone. Uh, mm -hmm. That was supposed to, you were supposed to wait until uh, they were interested and they were in the office um, for the second round interview to use the term locked in, um, as you said. And then you talked about how, would, and you you said you said in on interviews too, that your owner would ask very um, impulsive questions of, of these uh, individuals once they got or came in for the first round interview. Uh, would you mind sharing like a few, like what were some of the things that, yeah. that he tried to get the person locked in with? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, so the schedule, first of all, is, is pretty tough for most people. It's Thursday through Monday, off days, Tuesday and Wednesday, the hours of 11 to 8 p.m. Um, I came to find out later that the hour and a half that our employees would come in the office, they weren't getting paid for. Uh, so he would explain, that's our schedule, it's pretty unique, that that doesn't conflict with anything you have going on, does it? And, you know, that's a question that most people, they're in an interview, they wanna make a good impression, they're gonna say, oh no, not at all. Um, so that was one thing. Uh, just the difficult parts of the position he would ask that that doesn't conflict with anything you have going on, does it? He would frame his questions kind of like that. So again, being in an interview, you want to make a good impression, very agreeable. I would probably say, no, not at all. Mm -hmm. Definitely not. Yeah. I mean, especially if, if you're and again, you fit the mold of the, the perfect prey for these companies. You're, you're young, mm -hmm. You, you just graduated from college, you're very, uh, you're impressionable, you're looking for work, right? You're, you've, you've finished your formal education, so now you basically have to get work to survive. And no young person, especially with, and I don't need to know, but um, if you have college loans, you know, you're going to need a job. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to turn down. If, you, if you're in the office, you've been granted an interview, you're on the footsteps, you're, you're on the precipice of maybe getting this position, you're not going to say, oh, that, uh, that yeah. just doesn't work for me. You know, mm -hmm. of course you're going to say, well, no, it doesn't, it doesn't conflict with anything. Exactly. Um, now we are um, still in the middle of this COVID-19 um, crisis and, and that kind of, um, I don't know if it, uh, would you agree that maybe this kind of helped you get out because mm -hmm. of the unique situation that we're in? Definitely. Okay. Yeah. Um, and one of the, the things that you brought up was you found out that, um, of course, your office uh, qualified for the loans. And, but you ended up finding out that you were making, um, was it just as much or even less than, uh, than people that were just doing two hours a day training on Zoom, even though you were still remote booking mm -hmm. and, and working all day, right? Um, so how, I'm curious, how did you find that out? Yeah. So I was pretty good friends with one of our coworkers who is like the top sales guy of the office. And so we would talk every now and then about work and we both were pretty dissatisfied. Um, but he came to me and said that our manager's doing things that he doesn't think are fair. Um, and he said, you know, one thing is he cut the pay of my team without letting them know first. And he said, 
So they're getting paid. They went from getting paid blank to getting paid blank. And I was like, oh, I was thinking, is that what they're getting paid? Because they only had to work two hours a day on Zoom for training. And most of them were brand new hires. Um, so his concern was his team's pay basically got docked $200. And he didn't think that was right because my manager never went to them to tell them that they're not performing well and that their pay is going to get docked. Um, but the numbers that he used were pretty alarming to me because in the office I was getting paid 15 an hour, but because of the SBA loan, which apparently had to be used for payroll exclusively, or so I was told, um, allowed us to get paid more than we would in the office. Mm -hmm. But, and I was pretty happy with my wage, but to be getting paid 200 less than the salespeople on Zoom, was just really alarming to me. So I asked him, um, my coworker, I said, is that what they're getting paid? And he said, yes. And I was like, well, I'm only getting paid blank. Mm -hmm. And um, he was pretty dissatisfied with that. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to talk to my manager about it without kind of ratting my coworker out. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, since we're all working remotely, right. my manager is probably thinking, well, nobody talks, mm -hmm. even though we do. Yeah, and we'll get into that converse, phone conversation here in a minute. But I'm just, uh, I'm curious about this. So, um, number one, as an as a, uh, admin and a recruiter, you're still working full-time during this pandemic. Um, what are the salespeople doing? Like, I know you said there's, they're doing two hours a day on Zoom, mm -hmm. but are they, are they going out? To Walmart? Or are they are they doing anything other than just Zoom meetings right now? No. So I'm not sure what's happening like right now. Right. I think they actually did go back to the stores. But uh, for the time that I was working there, we would collaborate with my manager's promoting owner's office. Mm -hmm. And they would do training that way. And how did you handle interviews at that point? Because um, I would assume that you know, these people that you're bringing in for interviews, um, you know, we already talked about things you don't share with them, but mm -hmm. at some point they're going to have to realize that they're going to be standing in a Walmart selling mm -hmm. energy. So like, what did they do? Like if you hired somebody, what did they do? Yeah. So Zoom has this uh, option to do breakout rooms. I don't know if you're mm -hmm. familiar with that, but yeah. basically, um, these new hires would be put in a breakout room of all other new hires mm -hmm. and they would start being taught on the systems. Okay. So the factors of impulse, um, we actually had a training manual from our client, which is energy. Uh, they sent my manager and my manager's promoting owner, um, a packet, a training manual. So they would go through that with the new hires. So uh, that brings me to these, uh, to these calls that you sent us. Uh, the first one is between you and your, um, your owner manager. And you talk about a whole bunch of things. And um, one of which is what we just talked about with the, what you found out to be a, your pay. You were making mm -hmm. less working full time than mm -hmm. these guys working two hours a day on zoom. This is you um, kind of talking about, um, the pay that you feel you should be getting compared to everybody else. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, it's in comparison I'm, 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 to what I'm they're getting. Up, I'm opening it up for you. Tell me. Well, what do you think would be fair? So, based on the fact that you are working full time, right? Um, I, I am willing to go up to a thousand. Okay. Mm -hmm. Was that a uh, thousand per what per week? Per week. Okay. Mm -hmm. I just I don't know that I really trust that Ed and Briani aren't getting that already. I mean, I can show you the, the log if you want. No, it's okay. It was just a concern that I had. I totally get where you're coming from, right? Like, 
they're they're only doing this, so why should they get as much as me? Yeah. And I, I totally it's a valid point, and I totally get it. Um, mm-hmm. I wish you would have come to this like sooner, so we could address it sooner. Like three weeks left. Uh, I, I don't know if, if you're gonna feel like it's enough. Like change, I guess, if you will. Mm-hmm. I mean, there was no way for me to really know how much they were getting paid. And it's not really much of my business, and I didn't really think about it before because I would just kind of trust that you would um, understand that difference of the amount of work that they're doing versus the amount that I'm doing, and it, like adjust that amount accordingly. Yeah, so you know how how I just tried to space out the load and things that. Just- one kind of bet on where people are in their life and things like that. Um, and maybe I, I didn't articulate that well enough. Um, and, and I'm not trying to downplay anything you've done and the work you're putting in. Like, I think you're doing fantastic. Um, and I, I thought, because, you know, what you would be making in the office is less than this. Um, for me, I, I thought that was, uh, you know, fair. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I guess I should have spoken to you about it um, and, and what you thought. It's really interesting. You know, this, this guy, he's supposed to own his own business. He's supposed to be the, the boss. Mm-hmm. But it sounds like he has absolutely no skill of, of handling money. Because at the mm-hmm. beginning of that, he talks about, you know, well, what do you want? I'm opening it yes. up to you. And then you have, I think, of the perfect response. Well, you're, you didn't say this part, but you're the boss. What do you think is fair? Mm-hmm. You know, you're running this business. I'm not running this business. Um, you know, and then I think there's a lot of, um, I don't know, there's a lot of disingenuousness, I think in, in his voice there. And I've, 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 I've been around these people enough and I've, I've listened to them talk and they all talk the same way. And, and listening to the other phone call he sent me, I, I had to take some CBD oil to get to that <laughs> because that, that just the tone was just terrible. Yeah. But, but anyway, um, but, but he, I, I, he's talking about, you know, there's a lot of compliments to you, right? You know, I'm not doubting that you, you deserve this. You know, I, I'm, I get where you're coming from. That's, that's a, re- a relating tool. You know, it's almost mm-hmm. like the feet, the feel felt found um, tool in the, in the, in the field, <laughs> yeah. you know, where it's like, you know, I, to try to get someone to purchase a product, but um, you know, I'm, did you ever see, did you see the increase in, in salary at that point? And did you feel mm-hmm. like you got, you got through to him after that conversation? Yes. And being paid more than I would have in the office was totally enough for me. It was completely fine. But once I heard from my coworker that I'm still getting paid less than everyone else, it, it was just, and I don't know, that's just not fair. And it seemed that he kind of, made it sound like I was asking for a raise and I wasn't asking for a raise. I just wanted to be compensated correctly. Right. Yeah. And, and I, anyone who's paid attention to anything uh, these past few months knows that there is kind of a controversy about, you know, if, if you lost your job due to COVID, you're, you're making more on unemployment. Most <laughs> people are making more on unemployment than they would um, if they were still employed. Um, but someone like you, and, and, and these offices, of course, are kind of a, a unique situation because they're, they're independently operated, but they're part of SIDCOR, Smart Circle, whatever. So, I mean, they do qualify for the loans, but mm-hmm. I mean, someone who gets let go won't qualify for unemployment. So it's just a crazy situation. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, but yeah, I, I think if, if you were like you, if you were still working full time, if I'm on zoom for two hours a day, I should be making less than you because right. you are putting in more work yeah. uh, than I am. Mm-hmm. Um, now that conversation uh, continued into um, something else where you, you started raising some concerns about the uh, specifically the impulse factors mm-hmm. and kind of the um, just the, the way the business operates. So I want to play mm-hmm. a, a part of the conversation about that learning a lot more about the systems that we use. 
I just don't totally agree with them. And they might work for this type of business structure, um, but in using those systems in my type of work and in recruiting, I just, I don't know. I don't think that, I really believe in that type of system. What systems are you referring to? So mostly the impulse factors, um, which kind of leads into the five steps to a conversation, but it's, it's mostly the impulse factors that I just really don't think are right to use. Do you think they're manipulative? Yes. <laughs> Why? Um, Period. So we're told to bring the impulse up to a certain point on the impulse curve and then schedule them. Um, and when I was training with Uzma and Grant a little bit, uh, they were telling me about like, oh, if a candidate doesn't ask about this, about a, about the position, don't tell them. Um, but that to me, I just, I disagreed with that. And Grant said that I have to get comfortable with that. I have to get used to that. But I just really what, don't what think I can it, get used to that. What was it specifically that? They, you know, they were talking about. Um, I was talking about the position, and I think it was a mock call that we were doing. Um, but I told them about about the position and that we're in a retail setting. But they never asked about the position in depth. But I told them. Um, so it was mostly about the position itself. Was it like just going into? I mean, I wasn't there, obviously, so I don't know what the conversation was or the context of, like, hey, don't say this, mm -hmm. right? Like, obviously, it's like, don't tell them about the position at all. I, I disagree with that fundamentally. Yeah. Right? Um, I think they need to have some base level of understanding of what's happening. Um, and and I, I think our, our script did that, right? Now, if they're trying to get you to say kind of less specific about what we do, Yes, exactly. I think that makes sense, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, we don't need to go into full detail of exactly what the position is. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I have major problems <laughs> with anyone running a business who uses the, who is, quotes themselves as saying, we don't have to go into full detail about what the position is when hiring somebody. Why not? <laughs> Yeah. What are you hiding? And this yeah. is a common theme throughout Smart Circle, Sidcore, Credico, Cobra, Abco, whatever, whatever entity is controlling these things, we don't have to go into full detail. I, I, and that's why I'm such a huge advocate of asking questions. When you go on interviews like this, ask <laughs> questions. Because when you ask questions, the facade is going to start to crumble and it's not going to make any sense about mm -hmm. what they're doing. Um, I would think any self-respecting company would be more than willing to answer any questions that the, the interviewer has and to be clear, if we hire you, A, B, C, D, and E is exactly what you're gonna do every day. F, G, H, I, J, and K, maybe some of the time, but to come at it from an attitude of, well, we, we, they, they need to have, what were his words, a baseline under, a level of understanding about the position, but we don't have to go into full detail about yeah. that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I just don't understand that. Um, just offhand, do you know of anyone else in the office or did you ever come in contact with anyone else that expressed a problem with that or ever like any other admins that you talked to about being as vague as you were told to be about um, the operations of the company? I have not. No. Okay. <laughs> the admin that was training me, uh, they actually hired an assistant recruiter so she was getting trained also, but, and that was my concern that my trainer knew that I had a problem with that, but it's not a concern of hers at all. No, I do agree, but I just kind of feel like what's the point of scheduling an interview and going through the interview process when you're not really familiar with the role itself. And that kind of happened with me when I was when I applied first, I didn't really, based on the job ad, I didn't really understand what the posi position was for. Um, and when I was phone screened, 
still, I just, the position was still vague to me. Um, and then going in for my interview, I found out a lot more about the position and it just kind of felt like, oh, if I knew that I wouldn't have applied in the first place. And I just don't think that most of our candidates should be put in that position where they finally come to an interview and that's where they find out that this isn't what they want. Yeah, so I mean, to, to just touch on that point, you know, I think a lot of times candidates have the broad, like, I wanted a marketing position, right? Mm -hmm. And they have, like, this very narrow aspect of what marketing is. And when they come in and hear what we do, oftentimes it, it might not fit with their, you know, more narrow version of what marketing is. Right. Which, so, you know, yeah. If, if we get more specific, you know, yeah. maybe they, they don't come in for the interview at all, right? Um, but I've also seen it the other way, right? Like, where people come in and they're like, you know, I, I wasn't really sure about the position, but this is kind of exactly in line with what I'm looking for. So, I, you know, I think part of it goes both ways. Yeah. But, you know, I, I, I totally hear your concern. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so again, he, he talks about, he, he empathizes, right? I, I, I get your concern. Um, what I what it was interesting about that section is he talks about marketing. Most people that come in might have a broad understanding of what marketing is, but what we do may be contradictory to that because it's not marketing. This is a strictly <laughs> yeah. a sales job. Yeah. You know, there's there's nothing about this any of these companies that is marketing. Mm -hmm. It's all sales, exactly. um, and that's another reason why uh, a lot of these offices won't even mention sales in the interview process, mm -hmm. and you won't you won't recognize until you get in for either maybe the second round interview or maybe even the, the first day that mm -hmm. you're there. Oh, this is sales. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I know you yourself said that because uh, you had, you turned down the sales position to be admin because mm -hmm. I guess they needed an admin um, because you thought it wasn't a sales position, but you are literally selling this yeah. to every candidate. So when, when did you kind of accept that sales was a part of, of what you had to do? So my first day training, my manager went through the law of averages for recruiting. And the number that stood out to me the most was we had to make 100 calls a day. And But the number that stood out to me even more than that was we were supposed to have 20 um, interviews booked a day, which comes out to 100 a week. And I remember asking him, I was like, wait, just to clarify, that's 20 interviews booked a day, right? And he was like, yep. And that to me, like, that's a, that's a quota I have to make every day. Um, but when I, during COVID, when I was training with my managers, promoting owners, admin, <laughs> um, she was comparing our quotas to sales in the field. Um, there were some sales guys who were training with us because her point was, if you're going to have an office someday of your own, you have to know how to recruit. So they were training with us. And she was saying, you know, our job really isn't that different from yours, talking to the sales guys. Um, she said, the amount of interviews that we booked per day, that's how many sales we got. Um, as your conversation continued with your owner, uh, things took a little bit of a turn because you brought up SIDCOR, <laughs> uh, which is not something that these people want to discuss. They don't mm -hmm. want to discuss uh, the, the parent companies. But I also kind of didn't know that we were working technically with SIDCOR. Um, that's not something that I knew until a month or so into the, into working. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I do think that Zidcore is an MLM or they have that type of structure, um, which I don't know, right off the bat, I don't really agree with that type of structure. And I didn't understand that we were working with Zidcore or working under Zidcore. 
Um, so. Well, I mean, working with and under our, I wouldn't use those words for the relationship that I have with the corporate. Mm -hmm. They're our broker. Okay. So they manage the relationship with Walmart and NRG. But, right. You know, I, I don't work for Sitcor. I don't work, you know, call them for any decision making yeah. about what we do. Mm -hmm. But don't some of our funds go to corporate Sitcor? None of my money goes to Sitcor. Not the money that our sales reps make? Nope. Hmm. Okay. I mean, we get 100% of the sale that we get, right? Now, mm -hmm. Bitcor obviously makes money from their relationship with NRG and Walmart, mm -hmm. but our sale that our people make in the store, we get 100% of that commission. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> to be so blinded by, by the BS there is, is just unbelievable. Because <laughs> number one, I don't work under or work with Sitcore. They just manage our relationship with Walmart so and NRG. So, okay, so what happens if they decide not to manage that relationship yeah. anymore? You don't have an office, brother, mm -hmm. so you are working for Sitcore. <laughs> yeah. And the fact that he says none of my money goes to Sitcore, how do you think they're, they're making money, dude? Come mm -hmm. on. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. Like. Mm -hmm. Um, and his short answer, you said, so none of our money goes to Sidcor. If I was running a legitimate operation, I would, I would probably go into some detail there. Yeah. I'd be like, no, see, here's how the structure works. You know, yada, yada, yada. He just mm -hmm. says, nope. Nope. <laughs> Next question. Nope. <laughs> um, so apparently Sidcor just does this out of the goodness of their heart. They, mm -hmm. they don't, they're not expecting, um, to make any money. Uh, but, but, but what was really telling though about this, this conversation is um, where it goes next because he he's getting the feeling you're digging you're asking mm -hmm. questions you're asking questions that you don't need to ask yeah so that must mean that you want to leave mm -hmm. and he is uh, he makes sure to bring that up in this, uh, <laughs> yeah. the last part of this but yeah I don't know I just <laughs> this really sounds real like you want to step away <laughs> Yep. So I as know. soon as you started asking questions, Maria, you, he starts pushing, you know, this sounds like you, you, you want to get out of here. And it, yeah. it's, it's really, <laughs> I think it was his own efforts to try to accelerate you yeah. from getting out. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and you ended up, uh, so how long after this conversation um, were you, uh, were you out of there? So we determined that for the SBA loan in order for it to be forgivable, we would need the same, the same amount of people on payroll as we had before everyone was laid off. So the SBA loan was supposed to end June 24th. So he asked if I could help him get to that 13. Um, so that took about maybe four weeks, three weeks. Yeah, a month. You sent us another call of, um, I won't use her name, but she is supposedly uh, one of the top admins for Sidcor. Mm -hmm. um, so is she like, is she a national admin? She's like one notch under a national admin. Sometimes okay. she would run the national admin calls. Okay. You kind of go through, uh, the call kind of goes through the whole pitch of an admin. And it's, and like you said earlier, it's the exact same uh, five steps to a conversation that sales reps use, um, you know, intro, short story, um, all the way down to the close and, and even the, the rehash. Um, but I want to play a few parts of this uh, conversation. Uh, one of the, uh, in, in a former, um, in another episode of this series, um, I believe it was Colleen's interview, she talks about control, um, how Smart Circle, and in this case, Sidcor, uh, they, they want to control everything. And one of the hallmarks of this phone call with this admin um, she uses the, the word control as well. It's, it's an admin's job, essentially, to control the conversation when talking to uh, prospective mm -hmm. um, employees. The position entails blah, blah, blah. Now, is that something that you'd be confident in doing the proper training? You're going to say yes or no, right? They hesitate. There's an opportunity to lower the skepticism, answer questions. 
expectations they have, we have a good gauge of whether that person's going to show up, right? Okay. And the answer, yeah, great. Well, the manager has time set aside tomorrow to discuss in more detail. This 10 a.m. work for you? Just sounds a lot more confident and to the point, right? And we could definitely guess who's going to show up for that interview, that, that second one, right? Versus just, hey, want to come in? I can tell you more about it. We'll see. <laughs> I want to make sure that you still rehash. The fifth step um, of the conversation is going to be your rehash. A lot of people forget this. They'll just go into, okay, I have you down for tomorrow. See you then. Bye. Okay. No. Because they're going to, you know, have questions and you want to make sure that everything is smoothed out. Very nice. You want to make sure the candidate knows exactly who, what, where, when, why. My who is who they're going to be meeting with. When you get here, you'll walk through the door and you'll see myself, Crystal. Or you can ask for Mary. Um, what? We'll go over the position in more detail, we'll cover things like pay and benefits, et cetera. When, all the, you know, why, interview process, all that fun stuff. And I also have them know that I'm emailing them and texting the information. So that's part of my rehash. I'm not only having them write down this information, I'm texting and emailing it to them as well. That's like a whole rehash. Does anyone have any questions about that, the five steps of the conversation, or if they structure their pitch in a different way that could be helpful? I do have a question. Oh, it's on my video. Um, I'll be getting like people that have really in-depth questions, which is pretty much like the preliminary interview. Is there any way to kind of wrap it up without seem seeming skeptical or seeming like you're just rushing it just to get them booked? Mm -hmm. But a lot of people do have like elections just on the phone. Mm -hmm. Do you have like a good way to just like go around it without doing a freelance pretty much? <laughs> Definitely. Keep it short and simple. Know your objections for sure. They're, candidates only going to usually ask a handful of questions unless they're like really, really weird. But they'll ask, you know, what's pay? Pay is 37 to 45,000. Is that within your range? So always like recoup with a question right back. It helps you maintain control at that point versus uh, 37 to 45,000. Okay. So a lot of red flags there for me. Um, you know, the, the person who asked the question uh, asked, you know, is there a way to not seem like we're rushing to not uh, create, to, to, to seem skeptical? And the, the person running this call literally just confirmed something that I've been saying the entire two plus years that I've been doing these videos. Ask questions. She said, candidates who ask a lot of questions are, to use her words, really weird. <laughs> yeah. No, they're not. They <laughs> want to know what they're going to be doing. Mm -hmm. And, and I, if I'm conducting an interview and someone is asking me a lot of questions, I view that as this person's inquisitive, this person is interested, this person knows how to construct questions and find mm -hmm. answers for what they want to know. Mm -hmm. This is the only scam, because that's what it is, that I've ever come across where you don't ask questions. The less mm -hmm. questions they ask, the, the more malleable, the more manipulative we can, uh, we can work these people, those are the candidates we want. And that's why yeah. if you go back through these other videos, people with uh, you know, sale, actual sales experience, people that have worked for actual companies, they tend to not get the interviews because mm -hmm. they're looking for people that are easily impressionable, yeah. college graduates, high school graduates, college students mm -hmm. that know no better. Right. And unfortunately, yeah. they don't, most universities don't teach critical question asking yes. <laughs> anymore, mm -hmm. um, if they ever did. Um, but another part of that, at the end of that, conversation she talked about recouping questions um always have a question to fire back at them and you've shared a couple examples of that too D this sounds like some or do you have a problem with this this mm -hmm. sounds like something that'll work so um pu again putting them on their back foot right making t letting them take responsibility for the yes no because a lot of times they're going to answer in in the, the negatory right you mm -hmm. know does this does this sound like something that's a problem? No, no, no. You know, that's, that's fine. Yeah. I can, I can work with this. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it kind of reframes the responsibility in a sense that it's the person being interviewed who's responsible for, for whatever this is. Yeah. Um, let's continue on with this um, conversation talking more about kind of the admin's role in this mm -hmm. process. 
naturally, they're going to ask you another question back. And then it's going to keep on going that way. But I think having a strong, very short answer and then resuming with another question is really, really helpful. And at that point, you know, when I'm rehashing that person, I'm going to tell that person too. You know, the manager is going to go a lot more into depth. This is just a short phone screening. The interview is honestly like 30 questions. So, or sorry, 30 minutes. So hopefully it's not 30 questions, this long interview. <laughs> 30 minutes. Feel free to write down all the questions that you have. They love that. It looks really prepared on your end too. And, and I really have to disagree with that. Like mm -hmm. if I'm if I'm the owner, I'm kind of surprised she said that, but if, if I'm the owner and I and I have a, a person who comes in for an interview and they have a list of questions <clears throat> to ask me, I'm probably not gonna be happy with that because yeah. <laughs> um, as we know, questions are not, um, are, are not looked upon positively in this. Um, so from your own experience as an admin, did you ever, um, well, you probably did. How did you handle someone on the phone who had a lot of questions? Did you encourage them to bring in questions? Did your owner ever kind of critique that in you? Like what was, how were questions approached on your end? So when I was first being trained, questions were like the scariest part of being on the phone with the candidate because we have different ways that we are supposed to answer them. Um, we're always supposed to, whatever way we answer is supposed to shed positive light on the position that we're phone screening for. Um, so they were always so intimidating to get questions because I mean, I know the answer to them, but I have to mold my response the way that I'm told to mold my response. Um, but towards the end of working, I did not mind questions because I knew the answer and, and I knew that at this point I can tell them the actual answer. Did your, did your numbers slide at that point? Yes. <laughs> yeah, they did. I figured. Um, were, did. were there any critical conversations held between your uh, your owner and you or a, a national admin and, and yourself? There actually weren't many times that that was addressed. There was only a couple times before I talked to my manager that I was looking to leave. Hmm. Uh, I wasn't making enough phone calls. I think I was making like 50 a day or 40 hmm. when I was supposed to make supposed to be making 100. Yeah. Um, and my trainer was like, you have to make more phone calls. Like you have to make more phone calls. You have to book more people. And I told her, I, I think I'm burning out because I can't do a hundred phone calls a day. And honestly, no, <laughs> no recruiter for a legitimate company should ever have to make a hundred phone calls a day, <laughs> let alone book 20 interviews, a hundred yeah. interviews a week. If, if this were legitimate, then these companies should be expanding nonstop. Mm -hmm. But the turnover rate is so ridiculous because people know that it's a scam and, mm -hmm. and it's, it doesn't lead to anything. Yeah. Um, and that's something else that was addressed in this phone call. Um, why, uh, why don't people show up? Um, mm -hmm. you know, you know, the, the word prelim is used. Uh, you, know, you get interviewees, uh, you set up an interview, but they don't show up. Um, one of the things that is talked about so much in this operation, whether it's sales or whatever, is building the relationship, finding mm -hmm. out about the, the other person um, and building that relationship, making them want to come see you. And, and the next part of this conversation um, talks about that very thing is like mm -hmm. they, they may have some suspicions, but they, they'll come in just to meet the admin. We, no relationship was built over the phone. They just didn't really connect with you. People will come in just to meet you. I've had several times where they come in and they don't know what they're in there for or they don't know what's really going on, but they know my name. That's it. They'll walk through the door and just be like, hey, Crystal. Now that's, that's interesting because uh, in an earlier part of the conversation, and I want to go back to this, um, she mentions that they should always know what it is that they're doing, right? But mm -hmm. now they're talking about how, well, even if they don't know, they're going to come in just to yeah. meet you. It doesn't make any sense. So she did mention talking about um, building relationships, which, which can be pretty difficult, especially in a virtual environment, right? You really don't know what these people look like. Um, you only have what goes on their resume, maybe cover letter. But um, for this individual, that's all she needed mm -hmm. because apparently she 
says lying to create a, a relationship is, is fine. Yep. Um, so let's play that part. So if I see that they went to some university that I know my friend went to, I'll say, oh, they have a really cool old main building. Every college and university has an old main building, so you can always use that. <laughs> <Scale space. laughs> and uh, they'll be like, oh, yeah. yeah, I actually had a couple classes in there. Oh, no, wait, which one? It's such an easy conversation starter. So I make myself relatable versus me trying so hard to dig up that awkward conversation. We've all been in that like lobby situation where we try to find something to talk about and there's just nothing there. <laughs> you have the person's resume right in front of you. Become relatable. Most important. It's so disgusting to me how she, and, and I don't know if she's on anything because um, <laughs> I know a lot of the people that run these calls seem to be on something. Yeah. But... It's just amazing how she talks about deception, you know, mm -hmm. um, oh, I, I went to this university or whatever. I know a little bit about this. They have a great this. They have a great that because every university does that. And then she mm -hmm. just laughs about it. She just yeah. has this little pathetic little <laughs> yeah. giggle about it that, <laughs> I mean, these, these people, and I don't know them personally, but everything I, I circumstances, they seem to just be the, the sleaziest, scummiest mm -hmm. people um and unfortunately they're in offices all over the country all over the world and it's mm -hmm. that's why it's so important to ask these questions yeah. because without the questions you can get sucked into these scams mm -hmm. uh, without ever thinking about it um and um so i'm i, I have to ask you since you were mm -hmm. an admin did you ever kind of stretch to to relate or to become relatable as as she said i was really bad at that i'm first of all, really bad at lying and fabricating things. So for me, that was really difficult. I actually don't think I ever made up a lie to connect to someone on the phone, but my trainer did all the time. And she said, if I actually was the person who all these people think I am over the phone, I would have 10 different kids. I would have lived in 50 different cities. I would have gone to three different universities and she said it's it's totally okay being fake over the phone and i have a fake laugh that i use all the time because candidates think it's really legitimate <laughs> and i just can't be that way that's too exhausting to do that every single day wow. <laughs> so i didn't do that that was too hard for me and actually one of my biggest critiques when i was training is that i couldn't build cpr which is creating personal relationships with candidates that was like my biggest critique that it was i wasn't doing that enough but i can't lie to people on the phone i just i can't do that yeah well if if anyone is still in the business watches this video uh they would call you a failure mm -hmm. rightfully so but i would think that <laughs> um i would be proud of that honestly yeah. Uh, considering what it what it all entails to be successful, even as an admin, you know, I, I think a lot of people who get in these these scams think, oh, the admin is, is kind of kind of removed, right? They're kind of different because mm -hmm. they're not going up to people uh, in a store or door to door and trying to scam them for AT and T or Directv or Energy mm -hmm. or you know Muscle Packs or whatever it is. Right. But I mean, it's still like you said, it's still a sales position. You're mm -hmm. selling <laughs> the opportunity. Um, to everybody. Um, and, and one of the ways that these companies get so many people is that they have all these different names, like you mm -hmm. said, for the same position. I think you said 20, 20 ads oh, yeah. yep. on ZipRecruiter for the same exact position. And, and the final part of the conversation I want to play um, talks about that, about uh, possibly changing the name, but making sure that it's consistent mm -hmm. throughout look at everything that you had sent that all of that needs to be very consistent can you imagine if they have had applied to sales and marketing coordinator and then get an email that says i can't wait to interview for the sales representative role and then their text says something different and then their interviewer or uh the interview confirmation uh email says something different that's going to have so many red flags that they're they're just not going to show up for the interview they're going to be like oh this is obviously nothing that's uh one of the biggest things you can do 
easily, easily, easily go on ZipRecruiter and look up your company's name. You can see what online. You can look at your website. Make sure everything is super consistent. If you use second interview brochures, even all the way down the line, beyond the first interview, if they do show up, make sure everything looks exactly the same. It's our office if we change the position title and stuff like that. We make sure we scrub everything. Everything is exactly the same, right? And that I'm just I'm honestly just blown away because so so many of these things that we've heard uh, and I, I guess kind of speculated on because of the circumstantial evidence over the past couple of years it so much of it's being confirmed in this interview mm -hmm. because we have it recorded. Yes. <laughs> I mean, she says. I can't tell you how many people who've done these interviews have brought up the phrase red flags mm -hmm. and she talks about if you're not consistent in, in the wording, it's going to raise red flags. She doesn't stop to think about, you know, this is a really deceptive and scammy operation we're running here. No, we want to, we got to make sure that we cover the tracks mm -hmm. so the red flags aren't as easily seen. <laughs> yeah. um, essentially what she's saying is, you know, you have to keep your deception consistent mm -hmm. throughout. Exactly. Which is horrifying considering how many people get, get sucked into this. Mm -hmm. um, and there's actually, I, I misspoke. There's, there's one last part of this call I want to play. Uh, and you highlighted it in this, in this message as being your favorite part. Yeah. <laughs> where she talks about, quote unquote, secret shopping. Um, essentially seeing what other offices in the area are doing mm -hmm. and adapting um, based on that. Yeah. Um, so let's play that. Interviewed with or spoken to, know what your competitors are saying. Uh, neighboring offices all in the, we have, we're in Chicago here so we send out a fake resume to everyone and we look at what their basic response is we even call them ask them some questions see what their objections sound like we sound exactly the opposite we've had to change our script we changed you know what we call it even every sentence became so oversaturated um, it can be a like what you call a position even I will touch on that uh, back in the day, uh, account executive, we changed it to manager, and now we're even kind of changing it into more of like a brand ambassador role since we do a lot more events and stuff. So just be aware of what your competition is. It'll help your um, ads and everything too. I just, I don't understand how, if this was a legitimate operation, you would feel the need to send fake resumes to mm -hmm. the other companies in your area because and you know you'll get a call back just to see like how they answer the phone what their objections are and change or modify your sales pitch based on on what they do i mean i, I guess one one way to look at it is uh you know it's it's helpful to know what your competition is doing mm -hmm. but I, I don't know i mean they're, yeah you're all you're all under the same Sidcore or smart circle umbrella, even though you're mm -hmm. supposedly independently owned and operated. But um, again, that's, that's just straight up deception to me. Yeah. Right. Um, mm -hmm. um, did you ever have to do anything like that? Did you have to kind of analyze your competition at all? Thankfully, no, that's okay. something that I probably would refuse to do. My trainer has told me that she's done that before where she will send out a fake resume. She'll call offices around where they were. They were in Illinois. Yeah. Since you've left, I, <laughs> and I know we're still in a, in a unique situation here because a lot of things are shut down. It looks like things are going to shut down even more. Um, but looking back on this, on this experience, um, now that you're free, um, you know, what, what, what is different? What do you, what, if anything, do you take away from this? Mm -hmm. uh, what advice do you have for other job seekers? Yeah, so I'm definitely more critical in looking for positions. And I've always researched positions before I apply for the position, and especially before going in for an interview. But it's easy to really want a job and follow kind of anything that you can get. Um, but having this experience... I've come to understand that the questions that you talked about, uh, asking questions in an interview is so important. And I've been taught by college professors to always have a list of questions 
for a, your potential employer. So I did bring some questions in my interview. And one of my questions was, what's your turnover rate? <laughs> and my, my manager did not give a very good answer. He said, our turnover rate is higher than, no, it's, it's lower than corporate, but higher than hospitality. And I was like, okay, but what in numbers, what is that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that well, I don't mean anything. Exactly. Um, so yes, my advice would be when you're going in for an interview, um, it's a two-way street, employer to employee. So yes, they may have an opportunity for you, but you're giving them at least 40 hours a week of your time. Um, so you have every right to know exactly what you're doing and the motivators of your company. So there is one thing that I've, I've noticed in looking at these extra takes and a lot of what you've discussed in your documentary, uh, the cult-like mentality yeah. and how these businesses really try to take you away from basically your life yeah. to mold them into what they want you to be. And my first week that I was working in the office, before COVID, I had only been working two weeks in the office. So my first week, my manager was talking about team night. Team night was every single Thursday, 8 p.m., which is pretty late if I'm going out at 8 p.m. and I have to be back in the office at 8 a.m. To me, that's too late. Yeah. Um, and I was thinking to myself, I hope I'm not expected to come to this. Every month is fine. Every week is a little bit too much. Um, and my very first Thursday working there, my manager asked, oh, so are you all good for team night? And I was like, well, I have some things I have to do after work. And he was like, what do you have to do after work? And I was like, go home and make dinner. And he was like, well, what do you do after that? And I was like, eat dinner. <laughs> and what do you do after that? Go to the gym? I don't know, live my life. <laughs> and it was just so much of, well, what do you do after that? Like, what do you do when you go home from work? I, I have a life yeah. that I will be living after work. <laughs> and um, the next day on Friday, a lot of my coworkers were like, why didn't you come to team night? And it, it was just so like questioned why I wasn't there and how, oh, you are expected to come to every single team night. And that was a red, another red flag for me, mm -hmm. being expected to go to team night. It can be, definitely be a foreign concept for a lot of these people, especially if they've, they've been in it long enough, because uh, they've given their life to mm -hmm. this, you know, then, and the concept of having a life outside of it doesn't make sense mm -hmm. anymore. Right. Um, and I know that the deeper I got into it, um, yeah, I, I pretty much uh, had no contact with anyone outside of it. Um, if there was something going on, I... I was expected to be there and I expected myself to be there. I remember, uh, like you said, team nights, there were a few times where I'm like, I got to go all the way home. That's like an hour drive. And then I got to go back to team night. That's almost another hour drive, but I feel like I had to be there. Like mm -hmm. you said, and yeah, it is such an insulated um, environment where mm -hmm. if you, if you defy the expectations, you're almost looked down upon. Right. Uh, which is very unfortunate, but it, like you said, it's another massive red flag that mm -hmm. if, if you're, if you're looking for the red flags, that's, it should be pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. It can yep. be difficult to see <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. Especially when it was my first full-time job ever. So yeah. I wanted to make a good impression. Right. Yeah. And, and they rely a lot on that too. If you're, if you're young, uh, if you're, if you're seeking, uh, even if you're not young, I mean, I wasn't, as young as you were when I got in this, but I wanted to succeed. You know, I wanted to, mm -hmm. like you said, give off a good impression, show them that I, I was willing to, to go the extra mile and, and do what I had to do to succeed. You don't want to appear like you're, you're slacking. Mm -hmm. You don't want to appear right. like, well, uh, you know, I'm going home. I'm not really doing anything, but mm -hmm. there are some nights where I want to not do anything. Exactly. Yeah, you know? for sure. Um, and you deserve it if you just work a full day. Yeah.